Uh, so is talking on behalf of uh, Professor Kashiras. Uh, and she's continuing about the, the, the talk of yesterday. So please, uh, the stage is yours. You can start. Thank you for having me here. And uh, so I'll, uh, my name is uh, Diane Doiju from the Kaksira School at Harvard University. And I'll be continuing Professor Kaksira's talk yesterday. And uh, my focus will be on uh, Moray of Moray super lattices, um, uh, which is a, a new type of system that uh, we've been uh, focusing on. And there has been a lot of experimental interest as well. Uh, so during this talk, feel free to interrupt me with questions and I'll try to monitor the Q&A session, but um, in case I don't, um, the uh, host will, will help me out. So uh, don't be shy to ask questions and I'll be happy to address them. So uh, just a quick review of yesterday's uh, talk by Professor Katsiras. Um, he introduced a single particle model for twisted bilayography. And this is a really framework that uh, was developed by our group um, using a multi-scale approach. So all of our calculations are based on density functional theory. Um, and we use DFT to extract parameters for our uh, more uh, uh, simplified models. But uh, running density functional theory itself is not really practical because, uh, as we know um, by now, the, all the twisted system has a really large system size and the land scale is uh, very large. So, um, so to uh, solve for the relaxation and the electronic properties, we developed this framework that Professor Katsuras introduced yesterday. Um, uh, for the relaxation, we have this local configuration space approach to, um, to solve for the uh, relaxation pattern in, uh, uh, in real space. And, and on the right is a framework to solve for the electronic structures in those uh, twisted bilayers. And uh, those are basically at different uh, scales and um, uh, one is built on uh, the other. And so uh, I'm using the same framework to uh, solve for the properties in uh, twisted multi-layered Moray of Moray system. And in particular, my presentation will be focusing on these two blocks. And the left is, uh, of course, the relaxation pattern of those uh, Moray of Moray system. And on the right, I'm using a low energy effective model to solve for the electronic structure of those systems. So again, there are a lot of experimental interests in those multi-layered uh, van der Waals uh, heterostructures. And the first of which is the consecutively twisted twisted trilayer uh, graphing, uh, which is also the focus of, um, of, of my, my earlier uh, earliest work. And in the system, uh, this picture, which Tim also showed yesterday, um, a Professor Ko Wang's group from Minnesota observed correlated insulating states and superconducting like states near the half filling of the moray of moray uh, super lattice. And the reason why we say it's a moray of moray super lattice is uh, the really low uh, filling factor. Uh, the filling factor here is uh, around 10 to the minus 10, which corresponds to a very large lattice that has the, the periodicity of around 85 nanometers. So, so this is really an order of magnitude, lower carrier density compared to the TBLG system. Um, and of course, there is a, a more intra, uh, more uh, more recent experiments by uh, Pablo Herrero Herrero's group and Philip Kim's group on this alternatively twisted trilayer graphing or mirror symmetric uh, trilayer graphing, meaning that the first layer and the second layer are twisted in the same direction instead of the opposite direction in, in the first case. And uh, just to note that if the system is perfectly mirror symmetric, this is not a Moray of Moray super lattice because uh, everything would happen at the Moray scale. And indeed, in the experiment, um, the observation is made at the Moray scale. 
However, in an experiment, it is really hard to make sure that the first layer and the third layer are perfectly aligned. So in that case, we would have a Moray of Moray super lattice. And I'll make more comments about that and how to make connection to the experiment. And finally, there is the bilayer graphene and the uh, BN heterostructure. Um, and um, so the system here, uh, here shown in the picture is AB bilayer graphene encapsulated by top and bottom boron nitride. And uh, this experiment in Pablo Herrera's group observed uh, ferroelectricity and hysteretic behaviors in the system. And also yesterday you heard from Professor Goldhauber Gordon's group uh, who also observed um, these uh, hysteretic behaviors in twisted bilayer graphene HBN system. So in both type of systems, there are uh, more of more super lattices uh, due to a twist angle and a lattice mismatch. So here is a quick outline of my presentation. And first I will be introducing the system of interest. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit about the geometry and how to understand uh, the land scale of the system. And then I'll go into modeling the relaxation model and the um, electronic structure respectively. And even though our model is completely general and it can be applied to any type of systems, I'll use, it, I'll, I'll use twisted trilogy as, as an example. But of course, I'll mention other systems along the way as well. So uh, twisted trilogy um, the way we can understand it is through uh, again, this uh, picture of interacting drug cones. And uh, you've already seen this picture from Professor Katsura's uh, talk yesterday. Um, in twisted bilayer graphing, the, um, you know, we already understand uh, at this point that the interacting Dirac cones would form, uh, uh, you know, would cause hybridization between these uh, two cones because of the proximity brought by a small twist angle. And at the magic angle, the Fermi velocity would be further reduced because the band would flatten out. And this would imply strong electron correlation and a, a signature by an enhanced density of states. And of course, the picture is largely the same if you have a third layer, but now the interaction can happen at both pairs of the Dirac cones. For example, if we consider the interaction of Dirac cones between layer two and layer three, it can be affected by the presence of the third layer, which is the layer one. So effectively, uh, we have to consider uh, both of them. Um, but because of the additional tuning knob, this will make the system more interesting and it gives it an additional degrees of freedom to control uh, the presence of the correlated states and as well as the density of states flattening. So this is very interesting, but from a modeling point of view, it is actually a very difficult system to deal with. And the reason is that the system is a periodic, even in the continual limit. Uh, this is very unlike the twisted bilayer graphing. And in the case, even in the case where a period, this is, uh, it, periodic approximation exists, the system size is really large. And to understand this, we can watch the following movie. And this is uh, similar to the one that uh, Professor Goldhaber uh, Gordon showed yesterday. Uh, first, we start by, by rotating only one layer. We can clearly see that there is an approximate periodicity that changes smoothly as the twist angle changes. But now if we start to rotate the third layer, in this case, you would observe more complicated patterns that evolve non-smoothly as a function of the twist angle. And you, you would also notice that even though you observe these large scales, each one of them are not identical. So as a result, we generally do not have a supercell approximation. So now we can take a closer look at uh, we can be more quantitative about the land scales in, in the system. And to understand it, we have to look at different harmonics of the Moray of Moray pattern. And so just as a quick review, uh, we can go over how we obtain the Moray pattern in just in TBLG. 
for example, to start with, if I define uh, uh, the matrix G to be uh, as, as follows, and the G1 and G2s are the uh, primitive reciprocal lattice vector that spans the monolayer uh, Brillouin zone. So this is the monolayer graphing. And the G1 and G2 are the column uh, vectors of, of this matrix. And then, of course, the real space lattice would be given by the inverse of these, uh, the G vector. And now with the rotation, uh, the monolayer reciprocal uh, lattice vectors are rotated. And I assume layer one is the only one that's being rotated. So the G1 matrix would be defined as the rotation matrix act on the G matrix and then G2 from layer two would be uh, the original uh, G matrix. And now the Moray pattern, uh, bilayer Moray pattern uh, would, can be calculated that by simply taking the difference between uh, these two, two matrices. Basically, we want to calculate the distance between uh, these two uh, reciprocal lattice vectors that are solidly rotated around each other. So this G12 that spans the reciprocal space of the Moray cell can be written as uh, G1 minus G2, uh, which is basically the uh, R Theta one two minus the identity of y by g, and of course the Moray pattern would just be again the inverse of these uh, uh, g vectors, and this prefactor would basically give you the Moray length. So this is how we obtain the um, bilayer Moray pattern uh, in real space. And so actually, in general, uh, taking the difference between the G1 and G2, um, you can have a factor in front of it, meaning uh, a, a, more, a more general case, sorry. Um, meaning that a more more general case would be um, basically oh. apologize for the technical difficulty. Um, here it is again. Okay, now it's back. Um, okay, so a more, more general case is actually that you can take linear combinations of the difference of the Moray pattern, uh, namely that uh, M G1 minus M of G2. And basically the dominant Moray pattern would be when the difference between these two terms are the smallest. But actually in a bilayer graphing, the distance is the smallest. You can one can clearly see that uh, uh, the smallest distance is uh, happens when n equals to m equals to one, and because in this case, um, uh, because in the in this case the magnitude of g one and g two are are equal. Now in in trilayer graphing, we go through basically a similar process to take the difference between. Uh, these G vectors, but now it's between the G vectors of the two Moray patterns. And in this case, we notice that the, uh, the Moray length are different and they're also rotated from each other. So there is no guarantee that the uh, MN uh, is one. So basically you can take any linear combinations of MNN and find the dominant Moray length by looking at the smallest distance. And here is what the picture uh, A is showing. So I'm, what I'm plotting is uh, these different peaks correspond to different Moray harmonics and as a function of twist angle by fixing uh, the second twist angle to be 2.8 degrees and sweeping the first twist angles. 
And the first thing we would notice is that um, uh, it depending on the twist angle, the dominant word length come from a different uh, different different harmonic. And also, um, so uh, right, so uh, uh, we can look at some examples of, of these uh, these peaks. For example, um, there are is a range of regions where the one one harmonic would clearly dominate in the absence of other other peaks. For example, this point B in the figure will correspond to um, the, the following real space picture. And we can clearly see that on the top, um, there is a indeed in a distinct trilayer moray pattern. And the bottom figure corresponding to a small tiny region here, which shows the bilayer moray pattern. Uh, from the two layers. And these two bilayer patterns are very close in, in land scale, but they are slightly rotated from each other. And uh, we can look at another point, which uh, corresponds to a dominant peak at the 2-1 harmonic, meaning one twist angle is twice, roughly twice as the other. And here, uh, again, in figure D, we see another dominant moray pattern. Um, but again, now it's between A a two by two moray cell and a one by one moray cell. So the interference pattern ha ha happens at the a different harmonic. But there is other regions where the there are a lot of, uh, for example, in this region where there are a lot of competing harmonics with similar length. And this is uh, the following picture. And if we look at the uh, picture on the top, you can see that there is no clear uh, land scale that describes the trial amore pattern. And this is a more uh, difficult case because really clearly this, this there is no uh, approximate periodicity. And so we can also look at the more length as, as a function of both twist angles. And in this picture, uh, we are basically uh, only plotting the dominant more length as a function of theta one, two and theta two, three. And these dominant lobes are uh, are those uh, figures with a very clear, distinct moray of moray length, but in between are the um, uh, are the angles where many twist angles are competing with each other. And from this figure, you can see that um, uh, one observation you can make is that there um, uh, the the more of moray length scale does not evolve smoothly as a function of the twist angle. And the second thing you can observe is that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the moray length and the twist angles. So experimentally, if you determine the area of the moray of moray cell, I cannot tell you exactly where the twist angles is, but I can only constrain myself to a contour on this plot. And we can also apply the same uh, technique to calculate the more of more the length in alternatively twisted trilayer graphing or uh, when uh, L1 and L3 are twisted in the opposite uh, direction or in the same direction. Uh, type over here. Um, um, and, and you get a, a, a similarly complicated picture. Okay, so now with the understanding of our system, let's move on to solving for the relaxation pattern of such a system. And we will see how the domain would form in a trilayer system. And our goal is, of course, to minimize the total energy as a function of the displacement vectors from the relaxation. And our total energy has two terms, the first being the interlayer term, which describes the interaction uh, between layers uh, and it comes from the layer misalignment. And as, as Professor Katsuras talked about yesterday, the equilibrium stacking in the system is A, B, and B, A stacking, which means that um, locally the atoms would want to go to this equilibrium stacking. And the second term is the intralayer term, which describes the elastic energy from the surface deformation. And so this is very uh, good and clear, but of course our difficulty is again the aperiodicity. So uh, instead of looking at the real space, we go to a more local description of the system in, um, in order to have a more accurate description without a supercell approximation. So as an example, here is a picture of the real space and we can uh, zoom in near the three spots uh, locally here. 
and uh, say we are interested in the position of a red atom here in the picture. And the way we deal with it is that we draw a unit cell around the red atom and look around in, its, uh, in this local environment, this local unit cell. We'll immediately see that there will be a, a blue atom and a green atom from the two other layers. Um, so now to describe the position of the red atom, what you can do is you can draw two vectors from the red atom to the blue and uh, green atom of the other layer. And these two vectors would form a configuration space that uniquely describe the position of um, this uh, layer, this atom in, in layer two. And note that there technically there is a third vector, but it's starting from the red atom itself and back to itself. So this, this vector is always zero. And so uh, this two vectors form a four-dimensional configuration space that allow us to describe the system um, instead of the, the real space. And there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between configuration space and real space and has been shown in this, uh, in this uh, math paper. And now we can uh, for formulate our problem in configuration space by discretize the space. And um, one can also show mathematically math 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 that uh, the mapping between real space to configuration space is uniform by ergoticity of incommensurate systems. So with this, um, uh, with this space in mind, we uh, now uh, write down what each term would be like. First, the interlayer term would be described by the generalized stacking fault energy, which is the same as the bilayer. And uh, we extract the GSFP from density functional theory. And of course, this is a generic description for any type of 2D materials. And here I'm showing examples of graphing at WSC2 of two different orientations. And the interlayer energy is the sum of uh, every pair of interlayer interactions between uh, layer one, two, and layer two, three. And also note that the argument is the relaxed local relax, uh, displacement vectors. So this big B is defined as the sum of the original configuration little b plus uh, the little u. So this is a really a relaxed position, meaning that if the atoms are relaxed to a lower energy configuration, uh, this B is say like an AB stacking after relaxation, the energy cost will be reduced. And the second term, the intralayer energy is uh, basically uh, described using linear elasticity theory. And again, we sum over three layers and the C here is the elasticity that tensor, we, which we also obtain from density functional theory by performing a strain and shear to a unit cell and do a, do a, a quadratic fit, fit. And finally, uh, of course, we have to integrate over all configurations. Um, and finally, this gradient of U is the strain tensor, which is defined in terms of real space gradient. And the strain um, tensor uh, there is a convergent factor between real space and configuration space, and that convergent factor is what gives you the twist angle dependence. Okay, so now um, let's uh, look at what the relaxation pattern looks like after the um, energy minimization. And first we can look at, uh, we can try to understand the relaxation pattern in configuration space. And um, here is an example of what it looks like. And I'm looking at uh, the relaxation between layer one and layer two averaged over the layer three configuration. And similarly uh, in B, I'm looking at the relaxation between layer two and layer three averaged over layer one configuration. And the first thing you notice that the, the relaxation strength is much larger when the corresponding twist angle is slower, uh, is lower. So this is similar to the TBLG case. In the bilayer case, uh, that's also the trend. And the second of all, you will notice that the relaxation would point towards ABBA stacking. 
And this is also not surprising because um, as we say, as we mentioned before, the relaxation tend to minimize the total energy uh, by pushing the atoms to equilibrium stacking. And this relaxation would also form domain walls between uh, each pair of, of layers um, as follows. Um, so uh, this is, of course, between neighboring layers is similar to uh, bilayer grafting. But to really see what's going on, we have to go to the real space, and um, uh, which will give you a better idea of uh, the relaxation pattern of the system. And so uh, go, to go back to real space, we use the uh, following mapping. And the idea is for every real position, a real space position R, we find what the local configuration vector is, which we find this uh, this B vector. And for every B vector, we have a uh, relaxation vector that corresponding to a layer L at this B. And then uh, this will be our uh, real space displacement vector at this R. And we perform this map, uh, mapping for every real space R. And that's how we obtain the real space re relaxation pattern. And so uh, now we, we, we can take a look at the following system with these two twist angles. And of course, the rotation convention is given right here. Uh, first thing, we can look at the relaxation pattern on the Moray scale. Um, and uh, the unit cell is given in a tiny box here uh, near the origin. And the top figure is the relaxation displacement vectors, and the bottom figure is the um, the curl of the relaxation, meaning uh, how much the displacement vectors uh, rotate. And we notice that uh, near the origin, um, there are uh, uh, rotations that is uh, the same direction as the as the global rotation directions. And this is to uh, you know, uh, minimize the A areas in order to, to minimize the total energies. And we note that there are relaxation indeed happen at the corresponding Moray scale of between layer one and layer two, as well as layer two and layer three. And now if we uh, zoom out even more, um, now the, uh, the black uh, box right here uh, correspond to the, the view that we just saw. And now we see some even large scale that emerging at a, at a different scale, which is the Moray of Moray. So this is showing that there is large relaxation. Uh, their relaxation happened at a large scale and uh, domain would form on this large scale as well. But if you look closer to each one of the um, distinct um, uh, or the, the global AA area, each one of them is different. And so uh, just for fun, we can take another step back and zoom out even further. And what we, we will see is that there are even, even longer scale that's emerged. And so the moral of the story is that the system is truly incommensurate. And when you keep zooming out, there will be more and more land scale emerging and this will uh, really never stop. And it, it shows our model's capability to capture the periodicity and uh, the true incommensurability of the system. And it's suggesting that this large scale moray cannot be ignored uh, in any sort of model. But another thing, uh, the system is, uh, is different than the bilayer system is, in, uh, uh, is another special case uh, where the two twist angles are, are equal. And so in this case, naively, one would expect that the relaxation between layer one and layer two, uh, layer three to be identical because of the symmetry. And indeed, there is a solution that preserves this symmetry uh, where you see that the relaxation in layer one and layer three are basically uh, equal and opposite. And the, in the middle one, uh, at the global AA spots uh, in the middle layer, uh, um, there is basically no, no relaxation or, or no rotation. But that's not the whole story because if we look at um, that there is another case where uh, another solution exists that breaks the two-fold rotational symmetry along the, uh, along the D direction. And you see that there are this large 
uh, pinwheel kind of motions going on that breaks the, the layer symmetries between one and three. And there another a solution exists with the opposite rotation direction. So um, this is uh, surprising, but actually we can understand it from the point of view of competition between misfit energy and, uh, and the intralayer elastic energy. And so what this pinwheel motion is doing is basically it redistributes the AA spot's density. And by reducing the density of the A spot, it gains, uh, uh, reduces also the, the uh, misfit energy cost. And the, but however, the pinwheel motion will cost elastic energy, um, meaning that, um, uh, how, uh, but here is uh, in figure A, we're looking at the, um, the total energy as a function of uh, the twist angle. So both twist angles are equal. And we notice that when the twist angles are small, um, both the symmetric type of solution and asymmetric solution coexist. And the asymmetric solution is slightly lower in energy. And this is suggesting that the reduction in the misfit energy uh, by the pinwheel motion uh, would outweigh the cost of elastic energy for those smaller twist angles because the, um, these motions, these pinwheel motions do not have, happen very often if, given the large moria kumori scale. But as the twist angle increases, the density of the global AA spot would increase. And that would mean that if you keep having this pinwheel motion, the elastic energy cost will be, become greater and greater. And so it's, um, so the, the reduction in the misfit energy is not enough to compensate for the increased elastic energy. And here there is a transition point uh, critical twist angle at, uh, uh, at, at 4.58 degrees um, where this, where this um, asymmetric solution almost becomes symmetric and the, the two, two solutions have equal energy. And this feature is, uh, is a feature of a bifurcation point uh, in differential equations, and it's uh, really a characteristic of a trilayer system. And uh, so lastly, um, of course, um, I want to talk about uh, a, a more uh, a system that has attracted more recent interest, uh, this kind of alternatively twisted uh, trilayer graphing. Um, this is a project in collaboration with uh, Professor Pasupathy in C Columbia University, and um, uh, I'm not going to talk about experimental detail here, uh, but I'm just to show sh I'm just to show our um, relaxation results. And basically, what we sh we we are showing here um, is the uh, local twist angles uh, with these two sets of global twist angles, and so the the variation of the local twist angles are calculated based on the relaxation displacement vectors. And we see that the relaxation happens form a triangular domains on the bilayer scale and also hexagonal domains on the large trilayer scales. And um, the first figure here is showing the uh, local twist angle between layer one and layer two. And the second figure shows the local twist angle between layer two and layer three. And the third figure here is taking the difference between them. And what it means that uh, this is telling you the twist angle between layer one and layer three. And so what we observe in this last figure is that there are large uh, regions with, um, with zero twist angle. And meaning that the after relaxation, the system would, uh, the, the layer one and layer three would really align themselves um, in, and form these large uh, uniform domain. And the experimental implica implication is that even if your first layer and the third layer are slightly misaligned, after relaxation, um, there will be large uh, local regions where they are. So um, perhaps that, uh, you know, in those kind of, in this kind of situations, um, the Moray's um, scale physics would be uh, observed. And um, if you, you, you consider that this large uh, carrier density. 
And so uh, another thing we can do with this is we can use a single number to quantify the uh, local twist angles by looking at the separations of the local OAA spots. And here in the figure on the right, I'm showing you the local twist angles converted from uh, the local AA separations uh, to a single twist, twist angles. And we clearly see the formation of three distinct domains. And the regions where the twist angles are uh, increased are uh, what we call the twist downs with uh, larger local twist angles. And then there are blue regions where uh, their twist angles are reduced, uh, which we call the magic morays. And uh, of course, there is a domain wall, uh, which we call the, the solitons. And from the distribution of the local twist angles, we can clearly see that um, uh, uh, the three distinct regions in, 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 this, in this figure. And um, this trend matches with uh, experimental observation, which will, I will not go into detail here. Okay, so um, now let me go into my uh, uh, section, last section of this presentation, which is to model the electronic structures in uh, these Moray of Moray super lattices. And our model is these momentum space continuum model. And uh, here is uh, again our system with, uh, with alternatively twisted uh, uh, trilayer graphing. And here is the real space type binding Hamiltonian. And basically what we do is we perform a block expansion to this real space Hamiltonian in momentum space. And similar to the bilayer graphing, there will be a million mini Bilanzo uh, near uh, uh, at the scale of the layer Moray length. Uh, but uh, what's slightly different is that uh, now you have two different Moray Bulan zones that are different in size and they're slightly rotated from each other. And note that in our model, we do not uh, ignore this small rotation unlike some other uh, more simplified model. And now after this transformation, these two models are essentially mathematically identical, but uh, a simplification we can make because we're only interested in the low energy physics is that we can take a finite cutoff around the Dirac point uh, and performing a, a low energy expansion. Um, so uh, again, we start from this real space type binding model, which um, uh, has uh, two terms, the intralayer term, which is the uh, type binding monolayer type binding model that describes the near neighbor hoppings. And also, also the interlayer term that describes the hopping between uh, different adjacent pairs of layers uh, between layer one, two and layer two, three. Um, and now we, we, we perform a plane wave expansion. And of course, the um, um, intralayer Hamiltonian would just be the Taibani Hamiltonian of a monolayer in momentum space that we all learned in our solid state physics class. And the interlayer term is uh, slightly more trick trickier because as you plug in uh, the, the uh, plane wave expansion to these two orbitals, there is a small rotations uh, between them, which um, uh, gives you a uh, selection rule on the off diagonal terms of the Hamiltonian. So formally speaking, the Hamiltonian can be written as a three by three block with the diagonal um, blocks being the intralayer terms and the off diagonal blocks being the interlayer terms. And the intralayer term um, in our model, we use a rotated Dirac Hamiltonian. And the interlayer term is given in the following expression. And the IJ describes the different layers and the alpha beta describes the different sub lattices. And the most important part of this expression is the delta function, which dictates the scattering selection rule meaning the momenta from uh, the different layers and how they can couple to each other. And in the, if we take the low energy limit and this expression can be reduced to uh, the familiar uh, Bistritter McDonald style uh, model with omega zero and omega one as uh, many have talked about in the school uh, to be uh, the relaxation uh, modified interlayer tunneling 
uh, vectors with omega zero de describing AA and omega one describe, describing a, a B tunnel width. So um, how is this different than the bilayer case? Well, again, we have to resort to this delta function, which is the scattering selection rule. In the bilayer graphing, uh, we only have one set of selection rule, namely the K1 plus G1 equals to uh, uh, K2 plus uh, G2. And this is to say that if the difference between the layer one and layer two momentum degrees of freedom are differed by a um, uh, Moray reciprocal space lattice, um, the scattering is allowed. Um, and this relationship gives rise to a uh, very clear momentum space lattice on the Moray scale in, uh, as in figure A. So we have basically a momentum space crystal and it's periodic. But now with a third layer, we have a second selection rule that we have to uh, basically obey, which is uh, K2 plus G2 prime equals to uh, G3 plus K3. And so basically, if you plug in the K2 from the first expression, we would obtain a, a, a relationship between the uh, layer one and layer three momentum degree of freedom. And when we, as we do that, uh, we see that all the degrees of freedom are interconnected. And as a result, the number of degrees of freedom get really large. And this is what the figure B is showing. Um, that's all the out momentum degrees of freedom in, uh, from all three layers. And uh, this is uh, still with a finite cutoff. And we see that um, those degrees of freedom do not overlap with each other, and which results in a very large basis set. So um, then how do we, if this is the case, how do we perform a cutoff? Well, in the bilayer case, um, for example, if we start from scattering um, uh, from layer one at the origin, we can scatter just by a reciprocal lattice vector of layer two. And say, if we want to perform a cutoff with this orange circle, that means that we can throw out everything outside of the circle. Um, and so this point right here can be discarded. But now the situation is slightly different with a trilayer. First, we start from the origin and scatter by a reciprocal lattice vector uh, G2, which brings you outside of the cutoff circle. But then the second selection rule tells you that you can again scatter by a reciprocal space lattice vector of the layer three. And the sum of these two can, can bring you back into the circle again. So um, this momentum cannot be discarded anymore. And this uh, very simple analysis shows us there is infinite number of degrees of freedom within a finite cutoff. And so our solution is instead of just constraining the scatter momentum or the sum of these two uh, vectors, we also constrain the magnitude of these, um, the individual G vectors. So again, we, we would throw out this, um, this, this uh, degrees of freedom here. But of course, the result of this is that we threw out a lot of relevant degrees of freedom and there's no guaranteed convergence mathematically. But for the purpose of our work, we are only interested in the Van Hoff singularity position and the magnitude of the density of states. And we have, uh, uh, we have, uh, we have shown that these properties are uh, basically uh, constant as you change the cutoff radius. So uh, we are okay there. Okay, so um, here let's look at the results uh, of density of states evolution as a function of the twist angle. Well, the first thing we do is we keep the twist angles to be equal and consecutive. And we look at the density of states uh, evolution as a function of twist angles. And we see that as we decrease the twist angle from large to small, the two Van Hoff singularities approach each other. And the, the separation between the Van Hoff singularities reach a minimum at around uh, 2.1 degrees. But in this case, uh, we notice that um, on this color scale, the magnitude of the Van Hoff singularity peaks, even though the separation is reduced, the, uh, the, the magnitude is comparable basically to a large twist angles. 
Well, it doesn't mean that the system is not as interesting um, as the uh, twisted value graphing. Um, not so quick. We can look at a more general case where we keep one twist angles fixed at three degrees uh, and change only one of the twist angle from large to small. And in this case, uh, we see that the two Van Hoff singularities, again, they approach each other as the one twist angle decreases. And finally, they touch at, at this value. And in this case, the two peaks completely merge. And also, the magnitude of the density of states is an order of magnitude higher compared to the large twist angle values. And note the, the log color scale here. So how do we understand the origin of such a density of state enhancement? Well, to, to see that, we can map out basically the density of states as a function of both twist angles. And what we are plotting here is basically the density of states maximum and the, the separation between the two Van Hoff singularity peaks. And what you would probably notice on the first side that the pro most prominent feature is that there are um, uh, density of states enhancements um, that has some asymptotic behaviors uh, that's approaching to this dashed line, uh, which also corresponding to the reduction of these uh, separation between the two Van Hoff singularity peaks. And uh, this dashed line is actually the magic angle uh, of TBRG. So uh, this makes intuitive sense because if we think about it, when one of the twist angles is really large, that means that the third layer is decoupled from the, the other two layers. And the, the system is effectively reduced to a twisted bilayer graphing with a decoupled monolayer. So naturally, the, the magic angle of that system would be at the magic angle of the TBLG. And so this makes us think that these enhancements are due to a TBLG perturbed by an external potential from the third layer. And to confirm that hypothesis, we can perform a perturbation theory calculation to extract the effective Fermi velocity. And what we can do is we can truncate the Hamiltonian to the first shell um, by keeping one, one, one degrees of freedom from layer two and three degrees of freedom each from layer one and layer three, which gives us a total of seven states. And here is the basis of the, uh, the wave function. And we want to solve for the zero energy states and which gives us the following form for the spinner components. And now if we um, solve for the effective Hamiltonian, write down the effective Hamiltonian uh, for, um, uh, write down the effective Hamiltonian uh, of the system in, in, to the leading order in Q, here is an expression you get and the coefficient of this expression is the, the renormalized Fermi velocity uh, with the following form. And if we're interested in the, uh, density of states enhancement, we will set the, the renormalized Fermi velocity to uh, zero, um, meaning that the band is perfectly flat, which gives us the expression of uh, alpha squared one, two plus alpha squared two, three equals to one third. Um, this is our magic angle condition for the twisted trilayer graphing. And if we take the limit of one twist angle to be infinity, say like if you take uh, theta two three to be infinity. This will give uh, leads to alpha two three to be zero, and so that means that alpha one two squared equals to one third, and this is exactly the magic angle condition in the TBLG system that's derived by Victor McDonald in 2011. Okay, so back to our density of states. Um, so here in this figure, actually the solid line is plotted, is plotting uh, this magic angle condition and it mat matches very well with our density of state enhancement, except for near the diagonal regions um, where the twist angles are, are, are nearly uh, equal to each other. And we also notice that there are density of state enhancements uh, in this region compared to all the neighboring regions. Um, so this suggests that um, these perturbation theory picture cannot 
uh, is not sufficient to describe these uh, in sensitive states enhancement. And this is a consequence of the hybridization between adjacent bilayer pairs with a shared middle layer, uh, meaning that uh, this is a really a uh, more of more scale hybridization and cannot be sufficiently described by a um, perturbed bilayer picture. And of course, we want to look at the band structure as well. Um, here is one example of band structure with the following set of twist angles. And um, of course, just looking at it, you will see that uh, all the bands are, are, are really messy and uh, the, a lot of them are nearly overlapping with each other. And of course, this is the consequence of the complex basis set of the trilayer model. Uh, because the basis sets have many uh, uh, now overlapping degrees of freedom and, uh, and we don't really have a brilliant zone. So I'm just cutting through a high symmetry line. So this is not really a periodic, uh, uh, really uh, periodic band structure, but this uh, gives us uh, some idea of um, what, what's, what's happening. And despite the messiness of the bands, we will notice that uh, the, these bands near the formula level are actually pretty flat. And indeed, that corresponds to a sharp peak in the density of states. And because this point is near the magic angle as we uh, predicted. And the third thing you would immediately notice is that the system really do not have a band gap as in the TBRG system. So the lack of band gap in TTRG has also been shown by Professor Brunerick's group in, in this paper. So the system has to be a uh, perfect metal. And so, okay, so now with all the theory, we can compare with some experiments. And the first check we did is um, uh, checked against a STM paper that was published in 2018. Um, they measured the, um, the density of state spectrum uh, basically of, of the system. And our model is able to uh, produce the correct peak position uh, peak positions that's measured from the STM uh, data. And what's probably more interesting is um, a system with correlated states. Um, here is a picture from uh, Professor Kowang's group on, on twisted trilayer graphing. And um, uh, the experimental consequence of a lack of band gap is that at the full filling, we do not have an insulating gap. But what happens is that there, um, the behavior if you look at the temperature dependence of the resistance, it is basically temperature independent. So near the full filling, you have a semi-metallic behavior instead of uh, insulating behaviors. And uh, second of all, um, you can look at the correlated behaviors uh, that happens near the, uh, the half filling. And this will correspond to enhancement of the density of states um, of, um, and but again, uh, as I mentioned in the very beginning of this presentation, that there is no one-to-one -one correspondence between the Moray of Moray cell area and the twist angles. So just from the full filling factor, I can only constrain myself to a contour on the twist angle phase space. So this contour that I'm pointing to right now is um, all the allowed values of twist angles. And the colors are showing you the density of states maximum um, on, on this contour. So based on the area and the uh, observed correlated behavior, we know that the density of states need to be enhanced. So we, um, we can conclude that we need to be um, on, on basically on this area of the twist angle space or, or, or this one, they're, they're related by asymmetry. And, um, even though we can we cannot uniquely pin down what the twist angle is, this gives us uh, some idea of where where you are in the space space. But of course, uh, this is based on the assumption that um, these correlated behaviors are indeed um, uh, coming from electron correlation. Um, um, and finally, uh, lastly, I want to also point out that our model is completely. Uh, generic and it can be extended to other th systems, even though that I'm sh only showing you results for graphing. Um, uh, you, you can extend it to a TMDC system by uh, modifying the intralayer term, of course, also the interlayer term. But the intralayer term would now have a stacking dependence um, uh, as de derived by, by Wu in, uh, in 2019. 
And you can also apply the model to graphing HBN system um, by including the effective potential from HBN as derived by Moon and Koshino in, in 2014. Uh, and this is something that we have been working on. Okay, so this brings us to uh, the conclusion and um, I showed you the uh, relaxation pattern and the electronic structure of these Moray of Moray super lattices and um, making connections to the experiments. And uh, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators in helping with the projects and of course for you, um, for your attention. And I'll be happy to take questions now. Thank you, thank you. So uh, let's see if there are questions. Actually, I don't see questions in the Q and A box. I don't know if uh, somebody is um, taking the opportunity to ask a question. Uh, I am not a theoretician, so the, this uh, kind of uh, calculations take me a bit offline. But my question is uh, about the computational resources. Uh, uh, which may uh, or you need to carry out these relaxations. I assume you have to define a very huge super lattice with a huge amount of atoms, right? Yes. So, so, uh, so the relaxation calculation is not atomistic. So, meaning that we uh, look at the local configuration space and dis discretize the configuration space. And it's indeed very computational intensive uh, because our configuration space is four dimensions. So, in in bilayer, you can discretize the space and the number of degrees of freedom will be uh, scaled as n to the uh, n squared. But now in trilayers, it would scale as uh, n to the fourth. Uh, this is a really uh, a huge increase in the number of uh, degrees of freedom and the computational cost will be uh, hugely enhanced. Uh, in most of the calculations that I show, I discretize the space uh, using n equals to 100a. So, uh, the total degrees of freedom is 108 to the fourth. And that means that on the cluster, I have to run it for um, several days with, uh, with uh, like 36 cores. So it, it is really a computational intensive calculation. Yeah, yeah let, let me, I, I just wanted to mention something very briefly. This is mm -hmm. not a large number of atoms. It's a large number of local configurations. Uh, I, I just wanted to make that distinction. And that's the advantage of the configurational space approach, because we cover, uh, by what Zoe was describing, we cover a very huge number of local configurations possibilities. So mm -hmm. this is just one configuration with many atoms, which would have been just one example, right? So that's how we cover all this phase space. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I see no further questions. So uh, I acknowledge again, we acknowledge again, uh, sorry for this her beautiful talk. Thank you. And uh, with uh, so we come to the break. We will take a half an hour break until five European time. And then we will reconvene for the last talk of the session of the, this afternoon by David Gordon. So thank you again and I hope to see you in half an hour.